Thank you for joining me, Naval. Naval Ravikant, founder and former CEO of AngelList and currently doing all kinds of amazing things. But Naval, the reason that I wanted to have you on today is because you've done something that I think is remarkable and unique. And it's not starting AngelList and it's not starting CoinList. It is the fact that you had a company that you started that was doing well. You were willing to step down as CEO and watch that company do even better. And frankly, there's so many people I know who aren't enjoying their role as CEO, but they feel like they have to keep doing it. And they're just too afraid to walk away. And so they end up living these not fully fulfilled lives and the company doesn't do as well as it could and you stepped out of that circle you were willing to can you tell us what actually happened yeah so i'm going to go through the best of my recollection as to why and how it happened but uh, i'll tell you there's no single overarching pithy wisdom that i have here there's nothing tweetable here it's going to be uh, a lot of details and uh, many of them are idiosyncratic to me so firstly i think of a ceo has at least three jobs and those three jobs are raise money and keep cash in the bank set and communicate the strategy and recruit and retain the team but then on top of it you also have product ceos who also provide product vision you also have sales ceos who also provide sales leadership it's daunting it's quite the burden on your back and you're usually bearing it alone. You can't confess to your board of directors or they'll lose faith in you and fire you eventually. And you can't confess, confess to your employees because they'll stop following you. And even your co-founders can help you to some level. But hey, you're the CEO. You're the one in charge. You took that on. It's an incredibly lonely job. And I've done it for a long time and I was burning out. I also think like a lot of being a CEO is frankly being the company psychiatrist. You know, you're always dealing with people issues. That's really what it is. Any company that scales up, you're dealing with people and good people and you're trying to figure out how to make them effective and collaborate with you and listen to you and grow with you. But it is a heavily people management role. And I'm kind of an introvert, actually. I don't enjoy interacting with people beyond a certain point. I get burned out. And I, I had been lucky or unlucky enough to have been a CEO of a company when I was 23. So this was much later in my career. So I already knew that it's kind of a booby prize and not something to be envied. And somewhere in the middle, I'd been an investor for a while, which is quite the retirement job. You know, you kind of just run around and bet on other people and you get uh, massive intellectual stimulation, but you don't actually have to do the people management part and you don't actually have trouble sleeping at night so to me that's a job and i'm an intellectual for me i want to use my brain to think my way through problems and the moment i've thought of the solution as far as i'm concerned it's done the problem is solved and then i get impatient as to why it's not solved and that's one of the reasons why i made a lousy ceo because i didn't have the patience for operations to me ceo was a high stress people management job that you did because you had no other choice because you wanted to make your baby successful you wanted to have your dream come true and so you were obsessed with it and you couldn't trust anybody else to do it. Did it because you had to, not because you enjoyed it. Because I didn't necessarily enjoy the job itself, other than the brainstorming strategic parts, I wasn't very good at it. And I knew that. So I was honest with myself at the parts where I wasn't good at it. I didn't pretend like I was good at it. And, and I brought in people who were good at it, like you. And you were the first one who kind of really showed me that, like, here are the things you need to do to be a CEO. You made it as methodical as anyone could. I mean, there's obviously an art to it. So when you came to me and you said, well, here's the methodical way to run a company, and you spelled it out as well as you could in your book, which was incredible. I looked at it and I was like, this is the right manual. Here's a really smart person who's figured this out and systematized it as much as possible. And I looked at it and I was like, I don't want to do this. And because I don't want to do this, I'm not going to be great at it. It's not my zone of genius. It's going to be a slog. I just don't want to do it. And I think this is where the zone of genius concept really comes in. And it's it's so important. If you're the founder of a company, you're probably world class in something, right? And it's sometimes going to be hard to identify what that is. You basically want to spend all your time on that thing. And everything else is a necessary evil that should be outsourced. And the beauty is there is someone out there who is world class at the thing that you don't like to do. And it's their zone of, zone of genius. So it really ends up being a recruiting problem, not a execution problem. There's a corollary to that. Don't hire good people who make you miserable. So very often we hire people who are good at what they do. They're in their zone of genius, but somehow they make us miserable. It's like a hard, hard for us to work with them. Get rid of those people immediately because their cost is not that you know, there's a little bit of conflict between them and other people. The cost is they're going to cause you to burn out. For me, like figuring that out was also really, really important. And when I step back as CEO, one of the big issues is you can't imagine somebody else running the company like yes. you do. The reason for that is because who else is going to have founder mentality? Founder mentality is someone who will just do whatever it takes to get the job done. They'll do customer service, they'll do recruiting, they'll stay up all night thinking about it. And so they say, how could I possibly recruit another founder in to run the company? It turns out that there are ways around this. There 
ways to do this. Now, you could acquire a company. So that's a common thing. So you acquire a company that comes with the founder CEO. Maybe that person steps in. But you got to make sure that person isn't burnt out. Because a lot of times they're selling their company because they're burnt out as a founder. They didn't bring in a CEO when they should have. And so here they are instead selling their company. But one hack that I found that has worked really well for me is to recruit in founders who have failed through no fault of their own. And this is a hard one to figure out. But a lot of times you'll have good founders who will start a company in a space where the whole space doesn't work. So for example, at CoinList, we recruited Paul Davison. He'd done a company before called Highlighter. Highlighter was tracking your friends on a map in real time. And there were a bunch of competitors in the space and they all failed because it turns out people don't want to be tracked even by their loved ones all the time. And so the whole category had failed. Paul had the best executed company in the space and even that failed. But Paul went on and he, you know, he had a chip on his shoulder. He was now a senior guy at Pinterest who had bought the remnants of Highlighter, but he was looking for something new to do. So we recruited him in and he was CEO of Coinless for a while. He was an amazing guy. He actually left to start Clubhouse, which obviously huge success. So that is an example of someone who failed through no fault of their own. Avlo Coley, who I recruited for AL Venture, he had done a social network for a lawyers, you know, it hadn't worked, but none of these vertical social networks had. And he'd done uh, what I thought was the most brilliantly executed cleaning service out there, Ferry, which didn't do that well, but none of them did. That whole category turned out to be a miss. So when you find a founder who fell through no, no fault of their own, the whole category failed. You've got founder mentality. You've got a person with a chip on their shoulder. They have operating experience. And at the same time, you know that they didn't bungle it in some obvious way. And those are really good people to take a bet on. And the way to recruit those people in is frankly, acknowledge them as peers. Give them an opportunity, acknowledge them as being your intellectual and capability equals, be very, very generous with equity, more so than, you know, the standard BC playbook would, would advise you and uh, recognize that you're recruiting in a partner who's still very, very high energy, who wants to win and can take this to the next level. That is phenomenal advice. I had a very good COO, Kevin Laws, who took over and shepherded the company for a while. But what really made it happen was we recruited in this guy, Avalo Coley, into uh, running Angelus Venture, who turned out to be the right CEO for the business. And meanwhile, I got freed up mentally. So I was no longer burdened with back-to-back -back meetings or having to deal with people issues or having to solve fundraising problems or customer service problems or even day-to-day -day product meetings. And I got time to think. And companies exist because the founder had had a burst of creativity and then executed around that creativity. And that creativity started with having an empty calendar. But over time, the calendar gets filled up and it gets replaced with a busy calendar. And a busy calendar is the death of creativity. It might be good for productivity if you're completely in exploitation mode, but no company these days can afford to rest on its laurels. Disruption is becoming more and more frequent. The lifespan of a company is going down. And so it's very important that you're always being creative. You're always reinventing yourself. And companies that succeed in today's environment, unless they get lucky and stumble into a natural monopoly and product market fit at the beginning, and those are largely apocryphal. They have to constantly keep reinventing themselves and they have to constantly keep creating products. And the founder is the best position for creativity. So even when I was CEO, I would do this thing where I would carve out two days a week with no meetings. That was my Tuesdays and Thursdays. No meetings, no calls, no nothing scheduled. And even then, like one thing would show up and you know destroy one of those two days. So I would get reduced down to one day per week that was free. But that day was the only day of the week where I even had a chance to address all all the actual problems facing the company in order of their actual priority as opposed to the order in which they landed in my inbox or the order in which like somebody else had decided they were urgent. It related to this is, you know, the, the practice of meditation. One of the reasons why people don't like meditation or find it hard to meditate is because when you first sit down, all of your unaddressed problems that you've been ignoring come barreling up to the service and assault you. And some of these have been sitting there for a decade waiting for you to address them while you've been busy, 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 busy. And I think the same thing applies in a business context. Like if you get busy, 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 what happens is the real nagging problems where you're like, hmm, are we actually building the right product? Did I actually recruit the right team? Oh my God, I raised money from the wrong investors. You're not addressing those problems. You're running from them. You're just hopping from meeting to meeting to meeting. So just picking the right direction to go in is way more important than how hard you work because there's only 80 hours in the week. And so by stepping back, it gave me time to be creative. And it took a while. It took about a year. But then, you know, we came up with rolling funds. And I think that was partially because I was on the beach. It was a shower thought. And then I got to recruit in people who I think are very creative as well and kind of push them to be creative. It gave me the distance and the time to sort of look at the company more objectively and to engage at a higher level. And so now the partnership that I have with Avlok, who's running Angelus Venture, is incredible. He is also a very creative individual, but I can usually come up with the full list of creative ideas. I can turn them over in my head for days at a time. Then I can pitch him on a bunch of them. He can push back where appropriate or accept where appropriate. And then we can think about them. And then maybe a week later, I'll come back and say, no, you know what? You've got enough going on. That's too much to do. Or let's just focus on this at the high level. And 
and that works really well because my zone of genius is much more in strategy and sort of high level sales and recruiting and I get to focus on that while Avlok does everything else and we also still have great overlap and at the same time like I have all this free time now which is incredible so for example in 2013 when cryptocurrencies were taking off I knew they were going to be huge I was mentally ready for them but I was busy with AngelList so I didn't even get around to focusing on them until much later in the cycle when most of the returns were gone and if I had been free of mind and free of time I would have probably invested a lot more in that ecosystem at that time now I'm kind of playing catch up so Travis Kalanick is an interesting case study he uh, had this company called Red Swoosh for a long time that was a peer-to-peer file sharing network it didn't go anywhere he kind of sold it maybe got his investors and their money back in a little bit but it wasn't a success and then he literally hung around for a decade in Silicon Valley talking to everybody chatting with everybody going to barbecues tinkering on side projects and I think a lot of people were like is this guy ever going to make anything of himself he always just seemed to be showing up at founder events and he's just free well I mean to his credit he basically kept his nose in the ground he was always open and engaged but he didn't commit and because he was free when the right thing came along which was Uber he kind of started that with Garrett Kemp but even he and Garrett didn't know how big it was going to be Garrett stayed a stumbled upon Travis was an advisor to the company they hired a CEO and a CTO to run it and it was only once it started taking off that Travis had the free time that he could just jump in and be CEO and help make that company great and obviously earn a much bigger outcome for himself and everybody else finally I would add that if you look at any company that really really succeeds over the long term and I'm talking about over decades and these this is like Microsoft Apple Amazon one consistent factor is that the core founder stayed engaged the entire time and that doesn't necessarily mean they were engaged as CEO but they were engaged at least at the board level they were on the ball they were watching out for the company and so you can very easily put yourself in a situation where you work 80 100 hour weeks in a company you can't step aside as CEO you do jobs you don't like and you burn yourself out and then the way that manifests itself is you completely crash and run away or more likely you sell the company you exit it early because you can't see doing this for the next 30 years or the next 40 years look at Warren Buffett he's 88 he's playing bridge he's still running Berkshire Hathaway and now he's not running it day to day but he's still overseeing it why because it's not miserable for him he set it up in such a way that he enjoys what he does like he says he skips you know to work every day because of that he can sustain it for a long time and all the returns in life whether in money or relationships or friendships or colleagues or whatever or product development it's compound interest it happens at the end the most money you make is at the end of the curve the biggest impact is at the end of the curve the largest customer base at the end of the curve so you want to go as long and as far as possible and that's only going to happen if it's sustainable it's only if it's sustainable if you enjoy it so I, I don't think it's bad to quote unquote walk away as CEO I think you just basically say hey I'm going to stay engaged at a certain level on the things that I'm great at for me that was creativity fundraising high level sales product creativity and some recruiting and I'm going to take the stuff that I don't enjoy doing and I'm going to give that to somebody else and that way I'm going to be more effective on the things that matter and I'm going to be able to sustain this for decades it's not going to burn me out and therefore the company will go much further Naval you just did something that no one else on this planet that I know of could do you just on one prompt wrote a book what you just said right now is okay. publishable as a book and it will be very popular because it is excellent. Please, please edit it a little bit because I think it may have. I will edit whatever <laughs> part, but that alone okay. was remarkable. Now, it doesn't surprise me because I've heard you speak like this before, but each time I hear it, I am awed once again. Now, there is something else I do want to ask you, though, because what you sure, describe please. is a perfect and logical justification for why someone who's not enjoying being CEO should let that title go, become chairman, recruit an, an amazing operator, and they can still be the strategic brain and product visionary. I imagine there are many people, in fact, I know this, there are many people who are in that position and think, yeah, but, and they're feeling fear and they're feeling anxiety. And so I'm gonna take this down one level, Naval, because you also were feeling fear and anxiety, the same fear that they're feeling right now. You talked about the success of Angelus now, but there's also your, your personal life. And you talk about what you're doing, but not how it feels. So I wanna talk about how it felt beforehand, like when you were your CEO of Angelus and not wanting to be there, how was your life? Then we're gonna talk about the fear that you felt of leaving. And now I wanna talk about what is life like for you now? We know Angelus is doing even better. You've created all these other entities where you've created you know, massive amounts more value, but what's your personal life like? I'm talking zero to 10, zero being it couldn't be any worse, 10 being it couldn't be any better. So let's go through that transition. You're CEO of AngelList, you're not enjoying it, zero to 10, how is your life? 
three out of 10, two out of 10 some days, Perfect. maybe four on a, on a good day. <laughs> Perfect. So then you and I get together. I remember you came to my house. We sat down. We talked for about an hour and a half. Your issue is, Matt, I don't enjoy being CEO, but I have to be. I have all these investors who invested in me. They all believe in me. I'm frankly sort of the, the, the famous one in the company. I'm the one that's attracting all the capital, all the deals. Without me, the whole thing falls apart, so I can't leave. And I said, whoa, 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 whoa. The ball. Wait, wait, wait. That's a big assumption there. I don't agree with that assumption. And then we talked about you actually leaving. You're like, oh my gosh, it's actually possible. But still, there was fear of, again, as you mentioned, if I walk away, it crumbles. Or even worse, if I walk away and it doesn't crumble, then did I add no value? That second one didn't matter to me as much. Okay. It was more just the fear of it falling apart. Fair enough. My ego can take it. If the, if, if, if the thing uh, works on its own, that's even better. That means I engineered something that works. So I'll take credit anyway. But, but you I, did I like fear today, it falling apart. Yeah, I absolutely did fear it falling apart. Absolutely. Because for a long time, you know, it was being held together. I felt like the force of will of the founder. That's definitely true for a lot of companies at earlier stages until they find product market fit. And it was still scary, even for a year to year and a half after I was gone, I don't think we had much in the way of like true product market fit. Real product market fit for the company arrived in the last two years, and it was actually directly traceable due to recruiting and creativity that I got to exercise after I'd been out for about a year. So there was still a year of fear in there. But I would say like today, if I could articulate how good my life is, they would have to lock me out because you can't have people this happy running around in society. My life is a 10 out of 10 across the board. It is perfect. It is fantastic. And it's because I got to engineer my life exactly the way that I want to with no compromises. None. Not in terms of who I spend time with, not in terms of where I live, not in terms of what I do, not in terms of when I wake up, not in terms of when I go to sleep. I only do things I find enjoyable at this point. That's it. And not even just enjoyable in the abstract. I mean enjoyable in this moment. If it's not enjoyable in this moment, I just walk away. And when you walk away, at least from a long-standing commitment you have, to something where there's a lot of eyes on you and you have a lot of fear, it actually gives you the ability to walk away from anything. Most of us, at least in some part of our life, we're stuck in something we don't want to be stuck in. And so walking away is not such a bad thing either. To give you an idea of how my life is right now, I don't keep a calendar. Wow, <laughs> I, mean, I had no idea. That, that's that to amazing. Me, that's right on. Yeah, now I'll set alarms and reminders for myself for things that I want to happen that are really important. And I do have an assistant who will text me, you know, reminders for things that are really important. I check email now once every couple of days. I don't even check it every day anymore. That's how sort of <laughs> calm my life is. That said, I'm busy all day long. From the moment I got up this morning to now, I've been crazy busy. I haven't had a chance to meditate today. I skipped my workout so far. I haven't had a meal. I grabbed a coffee on the go. How did I get this busy? because I've always got stuff I want to do and there's always a thousand things to do but now I'm prioritizing based on whatever feels both important and right in that moment but you, you can't live that kind of a lifestyle unless you're willing to dis disappoint people's initial expectations of you I can't emphasize this enough people don't understand the value of free time for a creative and productive person now certainly like if you're working at Starbucks right you need to be at a, there at a certain time and they need you to be there at a certain time but in a creative job which is really what technology is which is really what high tech startups are these are all creative jobs having control of your own time assuming you're self-motivated is the ultimate hack so at least for me, I prefer to live the unscheduled life. And that way, even when I'm doing the things that are less pleasant, I'm doing them in a moment where I don't find them as unpleasant as if they were thrust upon me. And not keeping a calendar is a great way to do that. But people say to me like, hey, I'll, let's talk tomorrow. I'm like, great, just text me whenever you want to talk. They'll say, well, you know, how about 11 a.m.? Like, I don't keep a calendar. They're like, okay, uh, 11 a.m. I'm like, I don't keep a calendar. Feel free to text me at 11 a.m. It always works out. Yeah, I think you said it earlier. Boredom leads to creativity. And I think that's absolutely right. You have to have distraction-free yeah. mind in order for the, the creative thoughts to well up. Creativity comes out of you've turned some problem over in your head for a long, 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 long time. Mm -hmm. You've seen it from every angle. You have other things to connect the dots to. And then you just wait. And then your subconscious mind does the processing. But if your subconscious mind is constantly being interrupted and is constantly being stopped because somebody just stopped into your office, a text message just arrived, an email just arrived. What you'll find is most of the times when people schedule a call with you, they don't actually have an agenda. They don't They don't really need to talk to you. It's the easiest way for them to kind of check the box and get the current problem off their desk and turn it into a future problem. Yeah, that's exactly right. I'm going to throw something at you, Naval, to add into your, when someone says, hey, will you talk to me? Here's what I do. I respond back. Can you give me a little preview of what we're going to talk about? And then they yeah. send me the preview and then I just answer the question and we never have to get on the phone exactly. at all. <laughs> <laughs> right yeah. The preview is good. Yeah, I usually, I, I guess mine is a little more rude, which is I say, hey, can we try and handle this on email first? I don't do calls unless it's 
original. No, that's or, direct. That's perfect. That's not rude. That's yeah. direct. No, but I, I like I like the can you give me a preview? Because you're right. Usually this is just the preview. Right. Exactly. Another one of the things you taught me, by the way, that I've been validating in so many other contexts, when you want to find the answer to something, like a reason why somebody is doing something. Like let's, let's say somebody says no, you do a sales call, you're trying to recruit someone and they say no, and you ask them the reason, they'll give you a reason. And then you ask them like, well, are there any other reasons, <laughs> right? You kind of ask them the same question again, and there are different ways to do it, but then they'll give you a second reason. The second reason is usually the correct one. I found that to be true across the board in almost everything about human relations. They're holding it back because they're nervous, they don't want to admit it to themselves, they're embarrassed, whatever it is. But usually, if you want to get the truth out of somebody in almost any context, ask it a couple of times or find out a couple of times, usually whatever the last thing they say is, is the real truth. Well, as you do with most things, Naval, you took something I did and you described it in a way which sounds even better. So I, I appreciate <laughs> <Marketing>. that. <laughs> and so to, to put a bookend on it, Naval, you share with us the very compelling version of why if you're not enjoying CEO, you shouldn't be there in the first place. And then you went deeper and shared the fear that you had, what your life like was before, which was three out of 10. You didn't fully say it, but you did say it. It's t maybe even 11, 11 out of 10 your life now. And now people have your example. Again, Alex McCaw went through this same exact thing about a year ago. And when I shared with him your example, he's like, oh, but that's Naval. Naval's unique. No, you know, no one else yeah. is like Naval. And then finally he took the plunge and now his life is a 10 out of 10. So now we have two examples. This is a trend. I think the next person doesn't have the excuse that these are unique in individual situations. They're not. This is just the opportunity to go have your cake and eat it too. And of all, I think you've done A, yourself an incredible service, but in doing so, you've done the world an incredible service in creating this example. So thank you very much. And my God, thank you for coming here and explaining it the way you do. It's just so fun to listen to your words. It just so happens that the words are actually really interesting and create a lots of learning but just on their own the way you speak is so compelling so thank you Naval this was thank you awesome. you're very you're very kind only you could have done this Matt because most exec coaches get brought in by the board and the last thing they're going to do is convince the CEO to quit or they'll never get called in by the board again and they put themselves out of a job in the process but because of your very unique and idiosyncratic style where you're really actually just trying to help people you can tell them the truth which is sometimes it's not the best job for them and they're meant for something bigger and better thank you well the reason is Naval as you know because I'm a only doing things that I have fun with. So I'm not doing this exactly. for a job. I'm doing this because I fucking love it. Exactly. And, and if I work myself out of a job with you, there's a hundred other people that I can go play with. Oh, there's unlimited. Exactly. Yeah, you've got infinite queue. No, I, it's my number one intro request is, hey, can you introduce me to Matt Machari? And I'm like, no, I think he's busy. <laughs> I only try and <laughs> right, on. right on. Naval, this was freaking awesome. Thank you, my man. That was, you know, Thank way you. more than I could have imagined.